Hi everyone, thanks for joining me once again on my channel right here on Thailand Bound. Right, it's a Saturday morning, that can only mean one thing, it's story time once again, and I'm very happy to report that I've got five brand new stories for you. These stories haven't been read out on this channel anyway, I don't know about other channels, okay? Uh, the reason there's five is because some of them are a little bit short, but I've just packed them into one upload so that I can have a full 30 minutes or longer, because I know some guys like uh, longer uploads, okay? Um, high season has come and gone now here in Thailand, we're into March, and uh, a lot of guys have gone back, so hopefully more and more stories will be sent in. If you're sitting on a story, please send it in, guys. I'll change the names. I'll make it completely anonymous, and you can hear your story right here w with me on Thailand Bound, right? With all that said and done, let's jump into the first of five stories today. It was about my 10th trip to Thailand, and my friend Mike and I had decided to go to the famous Bangla Road in Pat... Patong, Phuket, as neither of us had been to Phuket before. The taxi ride in was a ridiculous 800 baht, which I soon found out was pretty normal for Phuket because of the taxi mafia. The driver said he needed to stop and talk to a friend on the way to which I agreed, but that was a big mistake. He stopped about halfway and went inside a travel agency. He then came out with an older Thai woman who asked us if we needed a hotel. She could get us a good deal, she told us. We said that we had already booked a place right down the road from Bangla Road, to which she responded, Not true. All booked out already. Only I can find you a hotel now. She was very insistent and pushy. I then showed her the booking on my phone and she just smiled and walked away. We continued on for about 10 minutes, then the driver starts to pull off to the side of the road again and says, One more stop, please. To which I replied, no, no more stops, we're getting out and we're not paying you if you stop again. He said, okay, okay, I take you to hotel then. It was our first time to Phuket and we were getting stung as soon as we hit the ground. Not a good start. I should have known what was coming. We had arrived in the late afternoon, so I had a quick shower once we had checked into the hotel we had booked, which was about five minutes walking distance from Bangla Road. Mike said he was gasping for a beer, so he took off to Bangla Road and said he'd meet me there, which was only a five-minute walk away from our hotel. A few minutes later, he texts me to say I'm in the bar with the big tigers out the front. I was a bit worried I wouldn't be able to find him, but when I found the bar, I realised I could never miss this place. It was a huge bar complex with about 20 little bars inside and over 100 pretty girls spread out among those bars. Only one bar had a pool table at that time and Mike said he was in that one which was at the front of the complex. We only went there for a game of pool but talk about good luck, that bar had the hottest girls in the whole complex. So we played pool for a couple of hours with the girls and they played me like a violin. The hottest of the two was about 24 and she was all over me, constantly flirting. I asked if she would let me bar find her but she wouldn't give me a straight answer and kept looking over my shoulder while still flirting with me. I said to Mike, these girls are just trying to get drinks out of us. I don't think we're getting lucky tonight. Mike told me that the girl I was with and an old guy at the bar keep looking at each other and smiling. So I said to her, if you don't want, to bar, if you don't want me to bar find you, then we're going bar hopping without you. She said, I need to go and talk with my friend at the bar, but you come back at 11pm and I will go with you. I said, OK, we'll come back later. I realised that the old guy must have been a well-paying regular and she was super hot, so he must pay big money to spend time with her. He probably did me a favour, actually, looking back on it. I got away with a 1,000 baht drinks bill. Me and Mike explored quite a few more bars in Bangla Road. A couple of hours later, we ended up at a bar near Susie Wong's. It was a bit of a dingy bar, but as we walked towards the bar, I saw the most beautiful girl sitting at the front, waving at me and smiling. She took us inside and got us drinks and played Connect Four with me. She knew very little English and was very shy, so I knew she hadn't worked in the bar too long and I couldn't believe my good luck. We played Connect Four and drank for a while. She even convinced me to buy a couple of drinks for the Mamasan. I kept checking the bill to make sure I wasn't getting ripped off. It wasn't my first rodeo. When it got to a thousand bar, I asked her if I could bar find her. She said, sorry, but I have a girl problem today. I laughed and thought, oh well, I'm definitely not getting lucky tonight. 
So me and Mike agreed to make a new plan of attack the next evening. The next night, we started at Susie Wong's. As soon as we walked inside, we were greeted by little hotties whacking us on the backside with foam bats. Mike was in front of me, so he copped it first. It was so loud that it shocked me, but when I got my turn, it didn't hurt in the slightest. It was just really loud. Me and Mike could not stop laughing. We couldn't believe that every one of the 10 girls there was pretty much a 10 out of 10. I knew this was going to be expensive, so I asked straight away how much it was going to cost me. I asked the guy at the bar what the prices were, and he said, ladies' drinks are 300 baht, the bar fine is 2,000 baht, and the girls get paid 8,000 baht for long term. In Australia, it would cost me around 60,000 baht, so it was a fair price, but I was still thinking about how much money I'd spent the previous night and did not want to get ripped off here. We had a few drinks with the girls there, it was a great atmosphere, then we went bar hopping for a while. We had both been to all the bar districts around Thailand, but we were both still surprised at how big Bangalore was and the quality of the girls. This was back in 2018 when there were hotties everywhere. We ended up in another dingy little place a few bars down. By then I was starting to feel drunk and was thinking about calling it a night. When in walked a beautiful girl, she grabbed me by the arm, stared into my eyes and said, you take me to hotel. I laughed and said, we don't even know each other's names yet. So we got a table, drank, flirted for a while. She said that the bar fine is 600 baht and her fee was 4,000 baht long term. I was very happy and said, yep, sounds good. Let's go. That was some of the best aerobics I've had in Thailand. It definitely changed my view of the girls in Phuket. I think I was acting a bit too keen the first night and the girls could tell. Talk about acting like a rookie. Okay, so a pretty straightforward story there. Nothing, uh, I don't really have anything to comment on there. Just a couple of guys from Australia going out and having a good time on Bangla Road and why not? Okay, right, into story number two. I am 39 and have been holidaying and playing professional golf in Thailand for about 20 years. Very much a veteran and seasoned campaigner, my first trip started out in Pattaya, as many others do, straight off the aircraft. Throw the bags in the room and head out for the evening. After a couple of beers in a random bar on Soy 13, I was on the way to the toilet and a nice young lady stopped me and said, hello, handsome man. At first, I kind of shrugged her off and said hello in passing. On closer inspection, I thought may be in my best interest to play pool with her. We each won games back and forth and thought it might be time to have the grand final and ask her to head out to eat and then back to the room. We had a bet on the last game. I did the gentlemanly thing and lost the game. I took her out and enjoyed some local Thai food and some easy sightseeing along the beach. We were both looking into each other's eyes and I was hoping we had the same connection I was feeling. I asked her if she had a boyfriend of any sort and she said she didn't. She previously had a long-term Scottish boyfriend but was having some time to herself right now. I asked if she would consider an Australian guy as a new long-term boy boyfriend. She was absolutely delighted and accepted. We had the most amazing aerobics and I remember laying back thinking, Thailand has got me now. The moonlight shining through the window was a, with a perfect Thai body silhouette in front of me. We spent about 10 days together and had a really nice time. We said our goodbyes and made plans to see each other again in the coming months. I had a golf tournament in Indonesia and asked her to join me there for a holiday and walk around the course with me and my team. Again, we spent another 10 days together and I enjoyed every moment. I noticed that she never asked for any money, shopping or anything. I made sure she was well looked after and never went without. I was lucky enough to win both tournaments, so made sure some of the winnings made it back to her and her family. We became very close over the next three trips. I met her family, stayed at their house, and had some really special bonding time for them all. For various log logistical reasons, playing in Germany, Australia, and the UK, I found it difficult to get to Thailand for about six months. Understandably, we drifted apart a little and only every now and then had a token hello, how are you, over messages. I thought I would make a surprise unannounced appearance and see this beautiful girl. I walked into her bar and she was pretty happy to see me, although a little distant. 
Over the next few days, she asked for extravagant amounts of money and was very sassy towards me. I asked her best friend if she was seeing anybody and if there was any reason she wasn't being herself towards me. With a little persuasion, she said she never broke up with a Scottish man and she had been untruthful with me. I was shown photos of New Year celebrations, Christmas nights, out all on separate Facebook accounts I did not know existed. I thought I would see it for myself. It was only a matter of hours and I saw them together holding hands in the bar. I walked past her, gave her a nod and moved on. I truly wish her all the best and hope she is happy. Keep up the good work. I absolutely love your channel and appreciate the work you put in. It does not go unnoticed. Well, first of all, thank you very much for a very nice uh, compliment there. It's, it's nice to get compliments every now and again. Um, it, typical story, isn't it? A lot of the Thai girls think foreigners are rich and uh, they just you know, they just play them. And, you know, with you got to remember, with a bar girl, she's working there, isn't she? She's not standing in a bar every night because she enjoys her time there. She's in that bar uh, to make as much money as she can. And, okay, if a guy wants to take her out for a week and take her to Indonesia and have a nice time of course she's going to do it because she'll win one way or the other money wise or gifts um, but she's not going to be um, only with you she's going to be with lots of guys several guys and she'll have sponsors she'll be going out with lots of different guys so I think it's really important to remember if you you know if you want to have fun with these girls in the bars it's fine you know it's a win-win situation for everybody but the thing is try not to get involved because if you get involved you're going to get a broken heart as they say right okay um, I'm going into story number three my Thailand story is one that is not about the usual escapades of Thailand, such as girls and wild parties, but a story of a bizarre professional experience I had working in Bangkok from 2015 to 2018. I first visited Thailand in 1995, living there for a few years, about three times over the next 20 year period. I have visited the country almost every other year since. I lived in Bangkok every time and know the city very well and have a good network of established expat friends and a few Thai friends also. I happened to end up back there in 2015 after my divorce. I started looking for a job as my close friends suggested I should stay away from my home country and bad memories of the recent divorce and try something different in life. So after looking through the ads on JobsDB, I landed a sales job at an education institution. The job involved recru recruiting new students from other neighbouring counties. The department I worked in was a mix of foreigners, mostly in their late 20s to mid 30s. I was 39 at the time, but as us foreigners don't pay so much attention to age and se seniority, and as it was a new industry for me, I just got down to the work. The department was run by two guys, a director who was Dutch 28 and an assistant manager that was Swedish 29. They were bright young guys that had been in Thailand about three years and each had a real go-get attitude about them, not uncommon for men of that age, one could say. On my first week of work, they gave me a mobile phone to make calls. I found it all a bit cumbersome to have two phones to carry around, but just sort of went along with it for a bit. The phone was kind of performing strange as well and would get hot often and just suddenly shut down. I worked at a different sub-branch so I wasn't with the managers very often. About once a month or so, I guess, a work phone made sense. I sort of built up a bit of a rapport with the two work managers and joined them on a few nights out here and there and they came out to a property that I renovated. They acted like brothers and were still sort of finding their way in life. Doing all the things young men do in Thailand, partying and drinking and all of that, they would play the boss by spending the entertainment budget on staff drinks and both also did a lot of chatting up of the women in the work environment. They were real chauvinistic guys with inflated egos. I didn't take much notice of it and just figured they were mature eventually, so just engaged with them when I needed to. As in any work environment, office politics prevailed and I noticed some unusual behaviour from the two of them that started to feel like it was coordinated and referenced my movements and schedule on any given day. For example, I would go out to lunch and if I came back 10 minutes late, one of them would message me and say, are you back at your desk now? I thought maybe it's just connected to my work computer activity, but decided to start doing a few little experiments with it. As I was starting to notice, maybe my phone was being tapped. 
I'd been in the job for about six months now and had recalled I had taken my personal computer into the head office a few times and used the work software on it. I also started to think about how one of them would say, hey, let's go for a catch-up in the work lunchroom. And when we did, they just didn't really say anything during the catch-up as if it was to get me away from my personal computer. As I started to think about it, I wondered if they were coordinating tapping all of my electronic devices and started to go all over past events and sim think something isn't right here. Noting that on a few occasions they had messaged saying, close by your place, pop over with some beer. I started to get quite suspicious and wondered if they were placing some small devices near my house. I really couldn't make sense of it as this was only a little job in an education institute and not some kind of high stakes business deal scenario and I was just a normal guy. It was getting very Hollywood thriller like. So I upped the ante on the test by saying things about the management, noting I was going to reveal their behaviour to our CEO, but I would write it in a message in a dating app to a random person to see if they could read it somehow. They started responding by messaging me through line whenever I was out saying what's going down in Soy 20 when I was actually in Soy 20. They would also often message me on weekends when I'd been out on dates or had a sick day saying, did you get lucky last night or did you go to get medicine at the pharmacy, the one I'd been to? It became so consistent, either one of them would comment on my movements and phone messages daily with intense stalking remarks. Well, it didn't really bother me as I had a full social life in Bangkok and I didn't have anything to hide, but just question why they really cared. Were they that entertained with what life offered? I figured it was just a power move from them as they had some fairly sophisticated technology in their hands it seemed one of the guy's dads was a diplomat he would talk about how the government would come and scan his home as a kid for technology breaches i just started putting two and two together the final test was i invited them and had a few other colleagues to my house for a dinner party and they were sitting on the couch messaging each other laughing with their phones so i wrote in the dating app again to say tonight was a setup and that my tough Russian friend was coming to sort them out. I then had a friend turn up to dinner who knew all about the details, and as soon as he arrived, their faces just changed, and well, of course, he wasn't there to do anything to them, but he started by saying, have you guys got anything on your phone you need to share? The guy actually looked like a pit bull. They soon worked out that the game was up. They were both fairly wimpy guys, by the way, so as they say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, and they didn't even stay for dinner. They backed off for a few weeks and then started up again with the stalking, so I just kept saying crude things about them in other messages and kind of starting having fun with it. One guy was married, so I spoke a bit about his wife. Oh boy, that really set him off. I said I was going to tell her he was dating one of the girls in the office. After a while, it got boring, so I changed my phone and line accounts, and to my amazement, one of them commented saying, ah, new phone. And a few days later, they knew where I was and what I was doing by sending messages to me on the internal work chat as I'd blocked all other communications with them. I was just so astonished with what they were doing. And that's basically it. I don't really know what to say about that story. It's so unusual, isn't it? I can't imagine, you know, if, uh, working in an environment like that, that people would want to bug your phone. Um, really, I just don't have any, any um, not disbelieving the guy. It's just a very unusual story, isn't it? So I'll leave it there and uh, jump straight into story number four. I enjoy listening to your stories and thought I would share one of my own. My name is John and I live in Hong Kong. I have been to Thailand many times since the first time in 2004. I usually travel with one of my colleagues, Steve, who is from Texas. Prior to a trip in January 2010, I started chatting with a Thai lady whose name is G. She lives in Karat and works in a good job. Her English is very good and she had been to graduate school. She was and still remains single. We got along well and I went to Karat and met her and her sisters and nephews and nieces. We went to visit nearby sites with G, acting as tour guide. G and I both enjoyed temples and the conversation flowed easily while talking about temples. We exchanged stories about our past and generally had a good time just hanging out. No aerobics or even holding hands diminished the joy of spending time with G. I expected this since I had read that Thai girls in regular jobs do not get affectionate quickly. 
She was 25 years old at the time and I was 45. The age gap did not seem a problem and we really hit it off. The next time I met G was for Songkran of 2010. Her family had a big truck and she and her siblings and their kids were all piled up in the back of the truck. It was a fun trip and again it was totally platonic. I met G at least once a year or once in 18 months since 2010. She didn't ask me for any money for many years, though she did ask for a gift every time I went to visit her. We stayed friends and continued to communicate and meet regular. She said she wanted a friend to confide in and she was comfortable to slot me in that role. I learned that in her family only she and her brother had steady jobs. The other three siblings did some business or the other. These businesses were forever making losses and G or her brother would help out. I had met her immediate family and a few aunts and uncles many times and it was all fun and above board. We stayed friends with the occasional hug or holding hands when no one was around. One thing I noticed was every time we met her extended family, she would organise a big lunch or dinner which I hosted. The family was friendly and so I did not pay much attention to the expenses. In 2020, she told me that her brother had suffered a stroke and needed help with his hospital bills. The arrangement was that he would pay for the hospital bills first and then ask for a reimbursement from the insurance company. She asked me for 100,000 baht because she had already maxed out her credit cards. Since I knew her for almost a decade and because she said the money would be refunded by the insurance company and I would get back my money, I lent her the money since I have a good job and what she asked for was not a huge amount. After the stay in the hospital, her brother came back home. Unfortunately, he suffered another stroke and had to go back into the hospital. This time, a small swelling in a blood vessel burst and there was blood accumulation around the brain which required surgery and an extensive stay in hospital. She again asked me for help and I sent her another 300,000 baht. She had a regular job and earned more than the average Thai person did. She used her savings to pay for the surgery and hospital stay for her brother and I saw her credit card statement which showed that she had been paid the hospital bills. Her brother was on no pay leave from his workplace for a year or so because his sick leave had expired. He is recovering and is slowly getting back to work now. He eventually got his reimbursement and I thought I would get my money back. However, this didn't happen. G claims that her brother paid her back 60% of what she had spent and did not give her the rest. She didn't mention a word about the money I lent her or what happened to the reimbursement related to the loan. Since the operation, G has been saying often that she misses me and loves me and wants us to live together in Thailand. Since I am no spring chicken, I did not want to get into a serious relationship and so played it cool. The requests for money have been continuing, but I'm not forking out any more cash. I don't know what happened to the reimbursement that her brother received from the insurance company, which he did not give her. I guess he spent it on living expenses during the year he was on no pay leave. This topic does not get much airtime when G and I speak or meet. Our conversations are not as relaxed and easy as before. I know that in Thailand family comes first and can understand why many foreigners are reluctant to marry a Thai lady, however beautiful and kind she may be. The future liability is uncertain in its time and amount. If I had moved to Thailand and stayed with G as she wanted me to do, then my, my savings would have already been used to sustain her family. Many of the stories about foreign men being used as an ATM that you read out on your channel involve bar girls. However, as I learnt to my dismay, being used as an ATM can be a behaviour of some Thai girls who have steady and reasonably well-paying jobs. I think I have to write off the 400,000 baht plus that I have sent G so far. Sometimes I think I've been too calculating and cold-hearted since the money is going to save her brother. Other times I feel I've done enough and that I'm not my brother's keeper. I still keep in touch with G, though it has fallen off to once in a few days. She still says she misses me and loves me and wants us to stay together. Sometimes she will ask me if I need money and she would try to get it somehow. One time she wanted to sell some land she owned outside Karat to me. 
When I told her that foreigners cannot own land in Thailand, especially agricultural land, she said that I can trust her and though the land stays in her name, it is only on paper and everyone knows the land belongs to me. So I asked her why she didn't sell it in the open market. She said something about access roads to the piece of land because it was behind her father's plot of land, etc. I don't have a conclusion because this is going on. I hope it doesn't get worse from here on in. Every time she asks for money or hints about me buying her or family expensive items, I just shrug it off. Recently, she wanted 400,000 baht for her aunt's wedding and 25,000 baht to buy her mother an iPad. I turned a deaf ear to these requests. I'm curious if you have any insights into this situation. Thank you for reading my story and I look forward to your comments on the situation. I have already changed names and places to keep myself and G anonymous. Keep up the good work. I listen to your stories at lunch and dinner regular when I'm eating by myself. I have some stories about helpers here in Hong Kong, which I have written down sketchily. Since it is second-hand stories and does not involve me, I did not think of sending them to you. If you're interested, I can write them up properly and send them to you. I have around eight stories so far. Well, okay, first of all, um, if the chat, if the guy's listening to this story, as far as the eight stories, yeah, I mean, I'm always looking for new stories. They don't have to be in Thailand. And uh, you just, you know, put put them together and send them in maybe one at a time and we'll see how we get on. But as far as the girl goes, I mean, come on. You know, she's asking for huge amounts of money, you know, 100,000, 400,000, 25,000. It wouldn't surprise me if the land didn't exist. And that means she's saying to the guy, okay, uh, you know, I've got this land, I want to sell it, you send me 3 million baht and the land belongs to you, and you can trust me, right? You can trust me, can you imagine? Uh, you know, he was quite right to turn it down, and yeah, he lost quite a lot of money, uh, 400,000 baht is about, it's about 10,000 pounds, 11,000 uh, dollars, I hope he doesn't pour any more money into it, because it's, it's just going to be a money pit. Okay, on to our last story today. This is story number five. It's a very, very short story, but I've just tagged it onto the story today because I think it's uh, quite a good listen and you might learn a lesson from this if you're a younger guy who's gone out to Thailand for the first time. Just a quick story of my first trip to Thailand in the early 90s. Last year, I returned to Thailand after a 30-plus year break and couldn't believe how it had changed and developed. Anyway, it brought back hazy memories of my first visit. After a, a four-year stint in London, myself and a friend were on a three-month trip back to New Zealand. We had a few weeks in Thailand and visited some of the islands, including Phuket. We were staying at Karon Beach and hired scooters so we could hit the bars at Patong. We had a great night at one of the Gogo bars and I ended up planning to take a gorgeous young lady back to my hotel at Karon. I was very drunk and was driving my scooter erratically with her on the back. Halfway home, I had to stop for a pee, and while that was happening, the girl waved down a scooter coming the other way, hopped on, and they drove off. I was fuming as I had prepaid the bar and thought I was being ripped off. I did a U-turn and headed back to the bar at breakneck speed. It was closed, and being a bit angry, I did a few 360s on the smooth concrete at the front entrance. I then returned home alone. The next day, I returned to the bar and asked the Mamasam why they ran off and that I wanted a refund. She told me the girl was scared as I was too drunk and that she didn't feel safe. I apologised. She gave me a refund, but I ended, spent, I ended up spending it at another bar for another girl. I drank less that night and had a very memorable time. Looking back, it was a dumb thing to do, but it was, I was in my 20s and we all make bad choices when we're young and silly. Anyway, I loved my visit last year, and as I'm about to retire, I think I'll be a regular visitor in the coming years, and my next three months visit is already booked. That story is wrong on so many levels, isn't it? I mean, it's very strange that the girl actually got on the back of his bike, because you don't suddenly get erratically drunk on the bike, you're drunk when you're at the bar, right? So it's strange, but you can't blame the girl, she must have been terrified, you know, especially if he was driving like that, uh, and the fact that he got his money back from the bar, he was very, very lucky, because I don't think that would happen nowadays, they'd probably turn around and say well it's your own fault for getting drunk and driving like a madman so he was very very lucky um you know i'm not going to say anything more on this story the guy's already 
said he was young it was 30 years ago uh, you know we all make bad mistakes but there you go uh, a good lesson for everybody there right that's it for this week once again I'll end as I always do if you're sitting on a story send it in it'll be made totally anonymous so nobody will know it's you and you too can hear your story read out right here on Thailand Band thanks for listening today guys and I'll see you next Saturday with hopefully a new set of stories